And I'm looking at Victor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies from Councillor John McLaughlin and Councillor Robert Irvine. Okay, thanks, Victor. And Paul. Oh, apologies from the Democratic Unionist Party, Chair. Thank you, Paul. And Adam. No apologies from the SDLP. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And Stephen. Uh, no apologies from Alliance. Thank you. And I know Josephine will be joining us in a, in a few minutes. Okay, can we move on then to uh, confirm and sign the minutes of the council meeting held on the 4th of April? And that's paper A. So we're going to take for accuracy. And that is page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15 and 16. And the earl is proposing. And the seconder, Diana. Thank you. And we're going to move to uh, confirm and sign the minutes of the special council meeting on the 15th of May. And for accuracy, page one. Can I have a proposer and seconder? Mm -hmm. And we, oh yes. Yeah. We have Councillor Feely, Councillor Green. Your proposing, Seamus, thank you. And where is Anthony? There he is. He's seconding. That's great. Um, it's grand. Did I sign them? Did I? Did yeah. Then was the one. Don't. Uh, yeah. That's okay. So now we're going to move to declarations of interest. I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to take it that there's not. Okay. Thank you. We're going to uh, then matters arising uh, out of uh, the minutes of the 4th of April, and we'll take them by page. So page one, page two, page three, page four, page five. Page five. Thank you, Chair. Just to draw members' attention to some items of correspondence, this was received in relation to various representations the Council made regarding the Energy Bill Support Scheme. Uh, so the first is from SSE Electricity, which indicates that if there are any specific complaints or issues for those details to be provided to the contact point, and they will require account numbers and so on to, to provide the further clarification. Um, the second letter is from the Permanent Secretary in the Department of Finance advising that as the scheme is not delivered by any Northern Ireland department, uh, we should make representations to uh, the relevant government department in England, which we did. And then lastly, uh, for the Department of for Energy Security and Net Zero, and that they have advised while they were aware of a small number of cases um, they have endeavoured to resolve those matters and noted that suppliers can reissue the vouchers or make payments directly to customers. Okay, thanks, Alison. All right. Thank you, Chair. It's just that general issue there on page five um, about addresses. Is it appropriate to raise this now or to wait to an energy discussion? Next item's coming up. Okay. It'll be more appropriate about yep. it. So. Diana? Thanks, Chair. Just, um, and I wanted to ask Alison about the letter. Um, 
Colm um, O'Gorman, he, he recommends we, we contact him, queries are sent to him. Did, does he have an email that we can contact him directly? Chair, we can seek that. There is a general, we've received a general customer inquiries email address, but we can certainly forward the personal address if we're able to get it to all members. Um, can I propose we do, please, Alison? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Diana, will you incorporate uh, the proposal to note? Yeah. And. Yeah. Keep to note. Okay, thank you. Bye. Right. And I'll second that, Chair. Okay. And Barry? Just on the next matter. That's okay. Okay, that concludes that one. So, uh, did you want to introduce the next, or are you happy enough to? So, Chair, this relates to the addresses, and again, the Council had made representations regarding the pointer system. Um, so, we have a few responses back. Firstly, from, uh, again, Department of Finance, who would have responsibility for LPS, and they have requested that to investigate the matter more fully. We had highlighted some particular concerns in, in Fermanagh based on the representations at the last meeting, if the information could be sent with the details of the addresses in question to the help desk, which is, is outlined. And then we had also been requested to make representations to the all the blue light services. So the Police Service of Northern Ireland and the Ambulance Service also confirm that they operate the most uh, current uh, system of pointer. Okay, yeah, all right. I right, just to seek clarity, you know, what exactly is the role of the Department of Finance and Personnel in trying to remedy this thing? This thing? Now, among those who have told me this is a problem, um, individuals, individuals have told me that when they buy something online, for example, from OMA, that it might come back OMA County for Mana. And also, people involved in financial services including people involved in conveyancing, people involved in the sale and purchase of houses. This issue is coming up all of the time. And, you know, people are sensitive, rightly so, about their county identity. So um, what is the role of DFP in resolving this? And, uh, and how can it be resolved, is my question, if there's any guidance from the Chief Executive. Thank you. Chair, my understanding in terms of L or DOF's role is as the accountable body for land and property services. So within, if you like, the, the structure of Northern Ireland government, the permanent secretary for the Department of Finance would have ultimate accountability for land and property services. However, all of the day-to-day -day decisions, operational arrangements and associated activities would fall uh, almost by default to LPS itself. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wonder, um, would there be merit in through our own communications if we ask members of the public if they have this problem to bring this to the attention of the Council? Because that would be a good way of collating, you know, what sectors, where the problem lies. Is it in these online deliveries? Is it when purchasing or selling a home? When does this type of issue raise its head most? Uh, so if that's appropriate, I would propose that we use our communication systems and our messaging to, to put that out to the people. Thank you. Chair, I, I would think of Councillor McElduff was content that what we could do, maybe in the first instance, we have been provided in the, the letter from Neil Gibson, the details of the, the email address that they themselves will seek to collate, to rectify the issue. So we could certainly communicate that through our own channels. People could certainly highlight the sectors or areas of concern to us. But I think if we were able to short circuit the system that citizens from this district were reporting directly to the department, I think that would be helpful. Happy enough there, Barry. Okay, Seamus. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, congratulations on your appointment. I didn't get saying it last night. So, um, just on the on this here is an old chestnut of, of mine. Uh, the way this was all rolled out, and um, uh, again, any of us that was about uh, in Fermanagh Council, well, this was forced through by a number of parties. Uh, even though there was eight thousand um, of a petition. No, uh, and it wasn't an online petition at the time, it was door to door and people signing it uh, against this uh, uh, pointer system. 
um, because they thought the townlands was going to disappear, which I believe that's what's happening. People's not using putting the townlands on the address, but that's a, d a different story. Uh, but just just on the uh, the, the problem uh, with what Barry was saying there about Oma County for Mana or Cunyan County Tyrone or Irvinstown County Tyrone uh, is that the Royal Mail, as far as I know, uh, refuse to change their delivery pattern. And when they are delivering to Cunyan, the post comes through Tyrone. Uh, now, Cunyan is part of the Brookborough Parish. Uh, ha so half of the Brookborough Parish is, is delivered from Enniskillen Post Office, which the, so the, the, them addresses with County Fermanagh has no problem. The ones that was coming uh, to Cunyan uh, had County Tyrone on it. Uh, so when they used their new address that the uh, Fermanagh Council had, had uh, put on it, uh, we'll say Grogi Road, County Fermanagh, which was previously Grogi Road, County Tyrone, even though Grogi Road was in Fermanagh, um, the post office was still, st or the, the Royal Mail was still sending the post through Tyrone. So when it came to Annis Gillen, a letter came to Annis Gillen, uh, they weren't delivering to Grogi Road. So they put a stroke through it, uh, put County Tyrone down on, on, on the letter and sent it back to, uh, to Armagh or wherever it, uh, uh, that sourcing. Uh, point was. So that was the problem. We had Royal Mail in here and we explained that all to them uh, a number of years ago and zero was done. Uh, they did nothing. So I would suggest, if, uh, and I'm second in Barry's proposal, uh, I'm suggesting that if Barry's willing that we invite them back in again because I really think it's them is the problem because uh, they are refusing to do, the council has the has the authority to on this uh, uh, n n naming and numbering on houses and streets and roads and all. But if the, these Royal Mail and them's not going to actually do their job, well, then this pointless us doing it because this is not going to be solved unless they get uh, that their delivery system is proper so that okay. people living in Cunyan are uh, confident to put County Fermanagh down. Or people where Barry was talking is confident to put County uh, Tyrone down because people in Cunyan still putting County Tyrone down because they know if they put County Fermanagh down that it won't come or there'll be a, a month's wait. So uh, I am suggest maybe we invite them in again uh, as well uh, to a meeting. Okay, Chair Seamus, Barry, are you happy enough to include that? And can I ask if you're happy to note uh, that as well, and Seamus, you're willing to second the noting. Thank you. And Victor? Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I'm not going to go over. I think Seamus has summed uh, the Please whole up correctly. And uh, it has been a problem. Uh, I came into Council in 2014. It's been a problem since then. We have met with everybody under the sun. We've had, we've had our own building control people in uh, trying to address it. And as Seamus alluded to, we met with the uh, a senior figure uh, on Zoom during the pandemic. The guy from memory, uh, it was based in London, and uh, that's probably two hours of my life I'll never get back because there was no point in talking to him because he didn't understand the situation. And as Seamus has said, it really does. I still, I, I'm in one of them people that's in that scenario where I have. Uh, for Mana address, uh, even though it's not recognised, and I still use my old Tyrone address to basically able to get stuff delivered and get stuff recognised. Thanks, Chair. Okay. And no, I appreciate, guys, this is a, a pressing issue, but unfortunately we can't solve it here tonight, but getting these people in, and at the end of the day, uh, it's their job to uh, sort it out. Uh, Paul? Yes, I agree with what you said there. It's the fact that Final Town postcode. That is the problem, it's the postcode. I applied for a new driving license there last week and I got the driving license and I put on Brookbar on it. 21 Alta Veden Road, Brookbar. And I put on my license, 21 Alta Veden Road, Brookbar, Final Town, plus the postcode. That's very confusing for anybody. 
Yeah. That is the problem. Yeah. They're not recognizing the, the, the change addresses. So we need them in and we need to have a, a variety of them in and be able to have a, have a thing. So are we all agreed members that we do that? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on on page six. Yes, Chair, thank you. Two, two items of correspondence for members to note. Uh, this was in relation to the Council's representations regarding the cuts to the education budgets and mindful that there have been further decisions taken in the intervening period. So we have a response from the representative of the budgeting team uh, in the Department of Education setting out the, the challenges that they're facing and uh, endeavouring to work within the Secretary of State's guidance and indicative budget. And the second letter, Chair, um, was really on a related point, and this was about the executive's children and young people strategy, and there were just some concerns, I suppose, about the rolling out of it, uh, the executive's office responsibility around delivery, and a request for clarification on what had actually been achieved. So that's the second letter with this part. Okay, thanks, Alison. Josephine? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, my apologies for coming slightly late to the meeting. Uh, I want to thank Alison for her report and I want to propose to note uh, both pieces of correspondence, Chair, and notwithstanding the recent positive uh, news that we've had from the Department of Education, I think members will be grossly alarmed uh, by the estimated funding gap of um, 436 million just to enable the Department of Education to stand still for the year 2023 to 24. Um, I think really um, it's an impossible task. And uh, I, I believe very strongly that it is the responsibility of the Secretary of State to look out for the interests of Northern Ireland and for the critical services uh, uh, that uh, need to be delivered to the people of Northern Ireland. Um, this is wholly unacceptable. Uh, it has been described uh, variously as a punishment budget, and uh, I believe that that is a, a fair description of uh, this budget. Um, I want to uh, propose, Chair, uh, that this Council would write to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, expressing our concern regarding uh, uh, his budget and particularly the impact that it is having in the education sector uh, in, and ask, asking him uh, to uh, urgently review his budget with regard to finding additional provision. Secondly then, Chair, in relation to the, uh, the correspondence in relation to the Children and Young People's Strategy Plan, um, unfortunately uh, uh, we know uh, that the eight outcome areas contained within that strategy plan will not be met if these swinging cuts are implemented. Uh, this letter refers to the fact that there was a, 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 a Children's Service Cooperation uh, Act uh, intermediate uh, report, um, which was uh, produced in draft strategy and would have gone to the Assembly we have in sight of that draft action plan, uh, but I would hope that we would get it as soon as the executive uh, is restored. I live in hope. But again, it's important as a council that we should show concern for our children and young people. We have always done so. Uh, we need adequate resources in education, health and other sectors. And I think we urgently require uh, a review of the uh, budget. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Josephine. Have we a seconder? All right. Yeah. Chair, I'm happy to second that proposal. And uh, I would like, in this contribution, to ask the Chief Executive if um, she has been attending uh, briefings, you know, and what are the messages coming down the track from the various permanent secretaries with regard to uh, cuts. But what I would say is uh, Sure Start is one area that absolutely needs to be protected. And Sure Start and Neighbourhood Renewal, I'm just going to put those out on the table now. And that would be 
big department for community stuff. Um, we know that Sure Start makes a tangible difference in people's lives, in young people's lives, and parents' lives. And we know that neighborhood renewal areas have excellent projects that are making a difference in addressing health inequalities and also educational attainment levels and lifting up people's life opportunities and life expectations. So I would like to think that there's going to be a moratorium on any interference with Sure Start and with neighborhood renewal areas. But maybe just in second in this to ask you, through you, Chair, the Chief Executive, if uh, what messages are coming from permanent secretaries variously. And just before I bring Alison in, are you content to second a note in? Yep. Thank you. Alison. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, the, well, I suppose what I would say, there has not been a consistent pattern of briefings by the permanent secretaries, but I have attended one from the Department for Communities and the Department for Infrastructure, and the Council has received correspondence uh, from the Executive Office um, in relation to the, their uh, budgetary arrangements. A number of equality impact assessments have also uh, launched uh, and indeed are closing today is the deadline for responses. The Council has responded to those and we'll be reporting those to policy and resources next week. But I suppose in summary, Chair, to respond to uh, Councillor McElduff's queries, my understanding is that uh, from the Department for Communities, neighbourhood renewal is being defined as a protected scheme, so there will not be any um, cuts taken from that. Um, I think in recent days there has been an announcement, now it hasn't been made formally to us, that Sure Start, there has been a, a sort of a stay of execution regarding the funding decisions around Sure Start, Bright Start and a couple of the other uh, funded programmes as well. But I suppose to conclude really, in summary, the news coming out from central government departments is very bleak. You'll have seen later on the agenda, we have correspondence from the permanent secretary, which is indicating a, a very significant cut to the council in terms of our rate support grant. Uh, there are significant impacts on affordable warmth schemes. We have very significant impacts on our good relations programmes. Um, the cuts as proposed will have very significant impacts on staffing resources in the council, our grant availability and on our general community service provision. We're still working through the, the full implica implications of those because most are due to take effect from the 1st of July. The indications are that while the departments will try to be cognizant of the findings of the EQIAs, given the extent of savings they have to find, they may not be able to be. So um, I think while there have been some perhaps short term uh, pauses in negative funding decisions, I think the overall outlook is going to be very bleak. OK, thanks, Alison. Seamus? Um, no, I, 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 my question has been answered. So. OK, thank you. OK, we're going to move on. We're moving on on page seven. Yes, Chair, just thank you. Chair, just again, a few items of correspondence. This uh, related to the Council's representations really regarding gambling addiction. And I suppose the concerns were twofold. For, firstly, the queries regarding the status and whether this was defined uh, as uh, mental health, the commissioning or lack of commissioning services for support, and then the ongoing uh, advertising and licensing inadequacies. So the first letter is from DCMS, uh, which is the responsible department um, in Westminster, which is setting out really that the gambling industry has its own code, and that's detailed uh, in the latter paragraphs of the letter. Um, the second correspondence chair came coincidentally from the Department for Communities. It was just part of its own stakeholder engagement programme, and this was regarding the betting, gaming, lotteries and amusements amendment, uh, the commencement order of 2023. And they've summarised the new offences and they're in the bullet points at the end of the letter, uh, which is essentially widening out the provision of the previous legislation. And then lastly, from the Public Health Agency, or sorry, uh, penultimately from the Public Health Agency, uh, firstly, the Public Health Agency is noting that there is no coordinated system of early intervention and, and intervention in terms of problem gamblers. And they also go on to note that they are not a commissioner of the service, and as you'll have seen later, nor is the trust, but they have referred us to the Dunlewy uh, helpline and the Dunlewy centre that provides support for those uh, with gambling addictions and their families. 
And then lastly, the letter from the Western Trust is just confirming that they're not commissioned to deliver a specific service around gambling addition. And if they were, uh, it would need to be on a regional basis. Ms. Allison. Sorry. Yeah, just to be brief, I, I raised this originally because of a, a constituent, a family, who contacted me regarding um, gambling addiction of one of their family members, and it was having a, a disintegrating effect on the entire family, and it, it led to many, many problems. And trying to give advice to that family, I struggled with the correct advice, you know, and it's quite unsatisfactory, the nature of the responses coming back. But for your sake, Chair, I'd be happy to note the correspondence proposed that. And uh, I think maybe later, maybe give the officers some space to think this out, but we should tackle this as an issue to try to improve services, maybe have an informal meeting with the relevant providers, Dunlewy, for example. I mean, does Dunlewy have a presence in Enniskillen? I I've been told yes. I've been told that through Fermanagh House, Dunlewy is contactable, but I would like to know because uh, otherwise it's just a, a, a helpline based in Belfast. There needs to be a more local local face of, of support. Thank you, Chair. Okay, and you're proposing that, Barry, yeah. Okay, Seamus. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I suppose on a, sli a slightly different note, uh, I did bring a, uh, a motion uh, about five years ago, I think it was, uh, to the Council around Yamlin, and five years later i don't think anything has ever been done uh, uh the motion was to um, uh, ask government to uh, bring legislation in to uh, stop um, these big betting companies from advertising during uh, sports events uh, anyone that watches the premier league or uh, any of these big sporting events will understand how these big betting companies glamorize sport uh, sports uh, some big uh, uh, named actors in um, making money of people's misery by by trying to glamorize uh, uh, sport as well uh, or sorry betting as well i believe i believe we should also try and follow up to see where that legislation is at the minute um, because I think it's crucial that it's got banned from our screens. Uh, it's our young people that they're trying to get to. Um, as a, a bus driver, I have, I have seen with my own eyes uh, young people uh, 13 and 14 with, with uh, betting apps on their phones. How it's supposed to be, I think you're supposed to be over 18 to get them, but the, that clearly isn't working. Uh, so uh, I w wouldn't mind to say, to, just to follow up on that motion to see, did it go anywhere and is there anything that we could do could, if Starman's got up and running again, uh, would uh, it be able to be legislated in, in Starman? But I, I probably not. It probably needs to be Dublin and uh, London that needs to do it. But uh, just on that, Anna. Okay, thanks, Seamus. Josephine? Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I support, support the comments of Councillor Michael Duff and Councillor Green. Um, it is a matter of huge concern uh, <clears throat> to me um, uh, as, as, as a doctor and as a parent as well uh, that people can have what amounts to 24 hour access to gambling. And um, it is a real problem, as Councillor Michael Duff has highlighted. It affects not just the individual, but it affects the whole family and really can lead to very, very uh, uh, serious difficulties. Uh, this is something which is really like a cancer growing in our community. I agree with Councillor Green that the legislation needs to be changed for the protection of people. Uh, and that needs to be done as a matter of urgency. In relation to the provision of standalone gambling addiction services, I think that is uh, patently uh, uh, becoming a necessity in our society. Uh, this letter from Mr. Gucky and the Chief Executive of the Western Trust uh, <clears throat> states that, you know, if it's simply a problem with uh, gambling addiction, there is no funding funded service for that. 
Unless the gambling addiction presents in conjunction with substance misuse or mental health difficulties. In fact, when someone becomes addicted to gambling, uh, if that has been going on for some time, it frequently uh, progresses to a very serious mental health problem and can lead to substance misuse as well. Um, so I believe this is something that needs to be addressed urgently. And I would propose that we write again to the uh, Permanent Secretary at the Department of Health, uh, just reflecting on the concern that we as a council have regarding gambling addiction and notwithstanding pressures on budgets to give consideration of providing funding uh, for a standalone gambling addiction service. Thank you, Chair. Are you willing to note the correspondence, shows me? I will. Yes, I will, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and have we a seconder for Josephine's, Josephine's proposal? Alan, thank you. Are we all agreed, members, on those proposals? Okay, thank you. Moving on, and uh, Alison will follow up on the on the uh, motion there for Seamus. Okay, moving on on page eight. Thank you, Chair. Chair, we have a few items here. Um, so, item nineteen point four on Southwest Acute Hospital. Uh, the first is a response from the Department of Health in relation to the Council's request uh, that the, the Department establishes a fully independent public inquiry regarding the Trust decisions surrounding the temporary withdrawal of emergency, sorry, emergency general surgery at the Southwest Acute Hospital. Uh, the letter states that all uh, necessary steps were followed, appropriate guidance was adhered to, and as such they, they will not be convening such an inquiry. Um, we've also correspondence from the Northern Ireland office on behalf of the Secretary of State, uh, which again is indicating they are not minded to convene such an inquiry. And the, um, the, la the last letter, Chair, which is linked but is, is slightly different, it's regarding specifically there were some queries regarding a daycare and the number of places available and the impact that the reduced service provision was having. So the response from Mr May is also included uh, with this. Uh, section of the meeting. Okay, thanks, Alison. Have we a proposal, Mark? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. It's just in relation to item 21.1, Alison. If I could make a proposal, Chair, that we write back to Peter May and ask him specifically to detail, and this is in relation to the adult daycare places and the short, and the short breaks, if we could ask him specifically to provide us with the latest monthly activity data, because I, I note they're quite careful that that's a very carefully worded letter. I mean, it's, it's fine, it doesn't say anything wrong, but it doesn't say anything particularly helpful either. And it was a, an issue, this whole issue of the remobilization of learning disability services. It was one that frustrated the last minister immensely. And we found the only way we had around it was by forcing or by uh, instructing. Sorry, Mark, can you just talk a wee bit closer, Mike? Some yes. people have it harder to pick you up. No, no problem. Um, I was just saying this, this is an issue that frustrated the previous minister and we found the only way we could get around it would was if we instructed or if the minister instructed the trust and the officials to publish the monthly data and we found that was a way to focus minds now unfortunately as soon as the ministers left post last year the publication of the monthly data ceased so it would be useful if and if i could make the proposal that through you chair if we write back to peter may and ask him to provide the latest monthly western trust activity data Okay, thanks, Mark. Anthony? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, it's on, coming on the same list there about adult day, um, daycare places there. It was an issue in my own village there not that long ago about them. Um, it was cutting it from, they only have two days and they were cutting it back to one day, but we fought them and finally got the two days back. It's, it's, it's um, very disappointing that it is to the way it, it is um, being read here to us as well. And I think that um, we just want to keep an eye on this. These are vital services for our people. It's just coming out of COVID is all that the, the elderly people had. They actually look forward to them two days and just just keep an eye on this and hopefully that there's no more cuts to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Adam? Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, if there hasn't been a, a seconder for, for Mark's proposal, I'd like to, like to second that. Uh, and, and just to, to echo very briefly 
Anthony's comments there in Garrison. It was a, a great work by the community as well to highlight that and, and to really fight for their for their daycare services there. It's not acceptable that we have to fight tooth and nail for every scrap. And Chair, I believe you're dealing with the um, Emergency General Surgical Services letter as well uh, at this juncture. And just to, to make a point that this temporary removal, it, it's temporary only in name, I strongly believe. Just look at Dealsy Hill, you know, and part of the problem is that civil servants can't be held to account in the same way elected individuals can be. Uh, and to fix this issue and to resolve this issue and to give the people of Fermanagh and OMA a fair treatment and fair access to services. We need an executive, we need a health minister, uh, and this is just another example of what abstaining from your job of government does. It just hurts people. Um, I don't think we'll get any further by ping-ponging letters back to them, Chair, so you'd be glad to know I'm not going to propose that, but I'll propose to note that letter as well at this stage if it needs to be done. Thank you. Will you uh, propose to note all of the correspondence? Yes, Chair. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Mark, are you happy to second the noting of the correspondence? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, are we all agreed on the proposal of Mark and seconded uh, by Adam there? All agreed? Thank you. Anne-Marie? Yes, Chair, thanks for letting me in. It was just, um, I think we were talking about the emergency services in South West Acute Health Hospital as well. So on that, um, coming back, if we could do an additional letter and um, and I hate putting pressure on staff, but I think to um, get into the nitty gritty, if um, the council can formally write to the Western Trust and just ask how many additional um, patients has been transported out from Inniskill in Hospital, any department, um, since the emergency general medicine has been withdrawn, just on a daily occurrence every 24 hours. Um, if any, and ask, also ask the Western Trust if they have commissioned any additional um, any ambulance cover or any private um, ambulance service cover, which would be given non-treatment to patients on route who seem to be medically fit to go via other means of transport. And um, also on that, um, what the waiting times um, is um, currently in Altony Galvin Hospital, maybe on a daily basis, because um, I feel that Patients travelling from Inniskill and Aroma um, are having um, to face huge delays down there, and the staff in Altley Galvin are probably um, getting really hard um, numbers coming to their doors with people just turning up because there's no general surgery in, in the Inniskill area. So it's having quite an impact, not only on patients down here, but having an impact, a detrimental impact on patients up in Altley Galvin as well. And also, um, maybe also to find out. Just about um, whilst um, on on the back of the transfers from here, um, people have said to me that it's depleting the um, cover which we have in our area, being removed, sent it out to other hospitals. So, just what the ambulance service cover is exactly that the trust if they have commissioned any extra. It's just for um, advice and. Um, just to inform ourselves here in the gallery and the, and the general public out there. Okay. If they withdraw the service, just are they giving us anything back again? Josephine. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I want to second uh, Councillor Fitzgerald's uh, proposal. I think it's really a very critical issues that she raises. Uh, and uh, I want to su support her in that. Um, some weeks ago at a private uh, briefing of GPs, we were given to understand, Chair, that there were two appointments of consultant surgeons uh, to the Western Trust who uh, were anticipated to take up post one at the end of the summer and one uh, in the autumn. And if Councillor Fitzgerald is agreeable, if we could just formally inquire uh, regarding those appointments and whether any of those surgeons will be um, uh, uh, supporting uh, the Southwest Acute Hospital. I also want to express my disappointment uh, that Mr May has outruled from the start uh, uh, an independent public inquiry into the decision of the Trust to suspend emergency 
general surg surgical services. I think the concern out there in the public is really, you know, could the Western Trust have done more over the years to prevent this situation arising? No one can argue uh, 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 against withdrawing services which are unsafe. But I mean, what really led to that situation? And in, at, in our meeting in April, I highlighted the pay disparity between consultants working in Northern Ireland and consultants working uh, in Great Britain. And also, there is also a huge anomaly between the pay for consultants in Northern Ireland versus the, the pay in the Republic of Ireland. And we have seen many of our consultants from the Southwest uh, Hospital hemorrhage uh, to hospitals down south. This must stop. It's not a sustainable situation. And I think it's something, and I know that we did uh, write to the Department of Health highlighting those pay anomalies, and I presume our response is awaited, as awaited. But, you know, these are issues which need to be explored because if we don't explore them in relation to the suspension of surgical services, other services in our local hospital are going to be affected as well. So it's something that needs to be urgently addressed. So yeah. uh, I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Alison has note of those, both from Anne-Marie and from Josephine. Okay, thanks, Josephine. Diana? Thank you, Chair. And just to support um, Anne-Marie's, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald's um, proposal regarding the ambulance transfer, could I add, if Anne-Marie is, um, is willing to add a breakdown of the cost of the private ambulance care? And also, um, the, the Trust has said repeatedly that in order to provide safe service that the emergency general surgery has been transferred temporarily. I don't think people here, people in this district have been reassured about the, the transfer to Adna Gelvin. I would like to see and propose that the trust provide us with messaging that the public understand that there is a synchronization, that when they arrive there, that they don't go back to the back of an A&E list, that we have an assurance that the transfer patients will be seen at Abnagavan with the with the utmost speed. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. That they go straight through to a, to a doctor. Yeah. Okay, that's another valid, very valid point to include in that. Uh, Seamus? Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I was glad to, to hear uh, Josephine saying there, uh, about the two surgeons that's uh, uh, possibly going to be um, hired into the Western Trust. Uh, I'm just wondering, is this some of the the Cuban uh, surgeons that we were we were uh, promised? Or uh, I'm just I'd be anxious for the council to keep us updated on how that is progressing. Uh, I wouldn't want it falling off the the agenda. Thank you, Seamus. Okay. And did we get or we do get a correspondence noted and seconded? Did we? Yes, we very well. Okay, excellent. Okay, thanks for those contributions, Alison. I'll follow up and we'll see what response we get back. Okay, moving on to page nine and ten, page eleven, page twelve. page 12. So, Chair, this just, if I highlight to members, the correspondence received from the DERA Permanent Secretary just regarding the farm business ID, and members had expressed concerns regarding uh, the department's checks on, on some businesses and the potential for grants uh, to be decommitted, and we had been asked to clarify really the policy intent of this, the implications of the policy for the farming industry, and particularly for farm families in the district. Um, so the Permanent Secretary has responded, really setting out some of the general policy principles, but is then asking if we could provide uh, more specifically the implications that we envisage and to provide those through to the department so that they can more fully assess this. Seamus? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this, this is something that I ra raised a few months ago. Um, I find it uh, very strange that the department say that it's going to have no no uh, effects, but then it wants us to uh, to give them 
uh, effects that this policy is going to have. It seems uh, a, a wee bit uh, reverse ways round. Uh, we did ask about uh, was there a Section 75 impact study done on this. I see that I don't think that they answered that. Um, they said that um, it would have no implications on, on, on the planning. Uh, I, I suspect that's uh, probably not not correct correct either, uh, because if you have a foreign business ID number, uh, I think that would be a major. Uh, I don't sit on the planning committee, but if somebody come with a planning uh, application that had a foreign business a, a number, I suspect that would be very relevant. Uh, also, um, for instance, uh, farmers or. Um, that's coming up to retirement or that, that maybe uh, got sick or wasn't well, and maybe uh, maybe not coming up to uh, uh, retirement, but uh, uh, maybe have a, a young lad, 13 or 14, that's too young to take over the farm, but the, the farmer is is uh, too sick or that to, to keep going. Uh, uh, in five years' time, that that uh, business ID number could be passed on to the son when he'd be old enough. Uh, for example, that that's one scenario that this this could af uh, affect. So the, I'm qu quite surprised at the latter, uh, and I'm quite surprised that they are surprised because it's them that brought in the policy, but they don't seem to know or have a, a thought of any impacts to say that that they don't think that it'll have any impact on anyone, but. Um, you know, they've done, they did no consultation with the farming organisations, they did no Section 75 impact uh, 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 st study. So how, the question has to be asked, how do they know that it doesn't affect anyone? Because they didn't ask anybody. Uh, it looks as if we are the only ones that has asked them the question. So just leave it at that. Yeah, Seamus, are you willing to note the correspondence as well? Just, okay, thanks, Seamus. And have a seconder to note? Uh, Anthony, thank you. Okay, going to move on to page 13 and page 14. 15. Page 15, please, Chair. Okay. Chair, just to, in relation to the correspondence received from um, the Interim Chief Executive of Invest Northern Ireland, this just related to a proposal the Council had received regarding financial services in OMA, and it had been suggested that we would write and clarify the position from Invest. So they've really just set out that if there's any individual with a business proposal in the first instance, they should liaise with the client executive or the regional office uh, in OMA. Okay. Josephine? Yeah, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Alison. I, I would like to uh, propose to note this correspondence and uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> the Council could uh, uh, use some of its good offices to uh, uh, communicate uh, this information regarding financial uh, services uh, to uh, the business community. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Josephine. And Stephen? Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, uh, likewise, I'm happy to second, although uh, I suppose we weren't expecting anything more, but I mean, the response I did find to be a tad over, uh, underwhelming in the sense that, I mean, it elaborates on the number of people that are employed in the sector across Northern Ireland, but it's been unable to elaborate on the extent to which that impacts uh, our district in particular. And in addition, I think that the suggestion that individuals should contact their client executive or alternatively contact our regional office in OMA demonstrates part of the fundamental flaw within the mentality of Invest and I, which is that they're waiting for people to come to them, whereas in reality, they need to be taking a far more proactive approach to address the fundamental divide between East and West, which is very much a material consideration. I mean, I was looking at figures the other day um, for 2020, and I think for West Tyrone in 2020, the money that was used to create jobs ended up with about 61, whereas in South Belfast, that led to 1,188. And fundamentally, if you're dealing with that kind of divide, you can't really de describe yourself as Invest Northern Ireland if essentially you are a job provider 
publicly funded by all of Northern Ireland, but which is essentially catering to one constituency. So happy to note, but I think there's a significant amount of learning and reform that needs to happen with this particular uh, organization. Okay, thanks, Stephen. I'm going to bring Alison in just yeah. to. No, no, Chair, it's just building on that point that Councillor Donnelly has made, and members will be aware of the Lions Review, which was undertaken into Invest NI. And I suppose very specific reference was made to the um, well, the potential of the subregions, but also how Invest has historically been a Belfast centred organisation regarding decision making. There is a current call for evidence underway linked to the 10X strategy, which is really about sub-regional place shaping and how prosperity can be dealt with, with differently, um, hopefully in the context of a new, maybe more energised um, invest NI and potentially with some realignment within the Department for the Economy. So uh, while we have made representations in the past, Chair, I would have thought that it would be timely for the Council to really make some formal representations to both invest on the department for the economy all of the data is showing that our council district is if not the bottom to, uh, second from bottom in terms of visits funding financial support there is certainly a, a logical argument to be made for leveling up within northern ireland and if that is to happen it's really in places like Fermanagh and oma that it should start there is much reference made to a proposed investment conference in the autumn that will either be convened by Invest or the Secretary, sorry, the Secretary of State or Downing Street or a combination. And I would have thought we would really wish to make uh, our pitch uh, for certainly for representation, potentially for hosting or having an involvement within such a conference. And just finally, Chair, members will also be aware of the recent appointment of Joseph Kennedy as an economic envoy who has stated he has links, I understand, to County Fermanagh and has a desire to, to visit. So it may be appropriate for the Council to extend such an invitation. So it's really just to say I think now would be timely to restate her position formally to the relevant agencies. Yeah, thanks, Alison. I've just, uh, if you note Alison's contribution there just in, in our next set of speakers, and certainly um, I think that Invest is under considerable pressure, or uh, what's left of Invest is under considerable pressure, or what's going to formally make up uh, in the future Invest NI. So we're probably in a good position as our as the most extreme rural uh, council to look for, for that uh, conference. And certainly uh, the economic envoy uh, um, coming in from the states is certainly somebody that we should uh, have a conversation with sooner rather than later. Earl, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thanks to Councillor Dehan for uh, highlighting that. Uh, I'd be supportive of what Councillor Dehan has said, but also uh, with regard to our Chief Executive's comments, I think it is very timely that this is the time to send out the various invitations that we can get that. This district, the largest district in Northern Ireland, with the smallest head of population, can be put on the map once and for all with regard to Invest in I. And I do welcome the review of Invest in I and see where we go from there. But I'd formally propose, if it needs a formal proposal, I'll formally propose that uh, those invitations be sent. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Diana? Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, there's currently Invest and I have the Ambition to Grow programme. And um, th there was an information session in OMA in May. Now it closes, I think applications close the 16th of June. I'd be very interested to know how many applicants came from the Fermanagh and OMA district after the closing date. These are for people who are not Invest NI clients. Um, there, there's funding of up to 45,000. And I think that's a yardstick to measure, really, um, the the information flow from Invest NI and, and to look at productivity from, F, from Invest NI to see, is there a response to that? And if not, why not? That could it be done better for this district? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think that, uh, thanks, Diana. And I think that's timely after my comments last night that I wanted to put an emphasis as Chair this year on businesses. And so I think it's uh, important that we get as much and we have some information on our website and so forth but that we get as much current and make that as current as possible but also to have these statistics 
that we're looking for and just to uh, show these people up for, uh, you know, exactly what uh, level of service they're providing for us. So I think that's important that we uh, seek out this information. Alan? Uh, perhaps uh, I'm uh, going to speak on Siskinor. Uh, maybe you're not that lengthy. Not just, just, not just yet. If you hold that thought, Alan, and come back in. Okay, Seamus? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, 10 years ago, I believe, uh, I wrote to uh, the then uh, Minister of uh, Economy, Arlene Foster, in relation to this. And uh, after uh, numerous emails, uh, we figured out at that time we were most definitely bottom of the pile on investment. It was something like 25p per, per capita uh, was being invested by Invest NI in, uh, in Fermanagh or uh, Fermanagh Oma, uh, whereas down in Belfast, uh, there's something like £2.50 per capita. So with the population there, you can, it was something like £650 million compared to uh, uh, maybe 12, 11 or £12 million here. It was, it was just outrageous. Uh, um, uh, I would wonder if Invest and I ha hadn't existed for the last whatever from their existence, would we really notice? Um, and I think if, if if the answer is we wouldn't, I think that's an indictment of of uh, what they have been doing here in this this part of uh, the of Ireland uh, for the last twenty or thirty years. Um, and I suppose we can't really just single out Invest NI as uh, the the culprit of uh, underinvesting or not doing their job in in Fermanagh. Uh, I I would suggest uh, if we went through every department from infrastructure to health to uh, to um, economy right through them all, education, I'd say we're at the bottom of the pile too. And that's a, a, a job of work that the Rural Affairs Subcommittee is actually trying to put together the stats on that so that we can come to uh, or go up to uh, uh, Stormont uh, with the facts and figures of just how badly this area has been treated over over the years. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to the, the Rural Affairs Subcommittee and uh, and getting on with uh, getting uh, a final draft done that we can go. So uh, just them few comments. Thanks, Seamus. And I suppose it's probably a case that it's not, if we have been badly treated, it's just to what degree we have been badly treated, I, I would venture to say. Uh, Barry? Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome the comments, by the way, that Councillor Armstrong made there about the, the particular programme that is available right now. Um, you know, while we've been very critical of uh, the centre, Invest NA, we've been praising in the past of our local office and their various attempts. And I did drop into the event which Councillor Armstrong uh, references, and it is the 16th of June. There is the possibility for local companies here under that Ambition to Grow programme to get £45,000 support. So um, if we could, as a council, try and increase the number of applicants to that programme, it would be uh, a good effort. You know, who are the companies that we know that meet the criteria, that fit the bill, and uh, I know it's, it's impending, you know, but this, the first thing I would like to do then, in light of what the Chief Executive said, I would propose that as a council, we invite uh, the US uh, representative. I think Earl has proposed okay. that, if you're willing to second those. To second it, yes, Joseph Kennedy, yes. The other thing I would... Uh, I'm sorry, Barry, are you willing to second then maybe? that... Um, what was the other thing there? The, um, yes. The various invitations then yeah. as well, that those okay. would go out as well no as, as uh, Did I do that up at minutes, we see about the conference and so forth. Um, one thing, I TEDx has been referenced there, you know, the TEDx economic development strategy. Um, recently, there was a trade NA delegation went to Westminster. I know they're going to the Doyle shortly, but we should be making sure 
that when uh, Glenn Roberts and Stephen Kelly and Colin Neal, whenever they go making the case for this region, that our 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 sub region is is there as well. So we need engagement with them. Um, we need to understand as councillors what is TEDx, what does it say about our area. So I'm proposing that you know when appropriate that we have a workshop on our economic development strategy. It's such a linchpin within our council, you know, such an important function within our council, our remit, that I think we should have a workshop on economic development so that councillors' ideas can be fed in and that we can be upskilled ourselves on the range of strategies that are out there. And what is our own economic development strategy? Thank you, Chair. Okay. And I'm just going to bring Kim in. Okay, thank you, Chair. So just to pick up on a couple of points, and we have been working very closely with Invest and I on communication of the information around ambition to grow. Um, we've been working uh, to share the information and to make contact with our local businesses. Anecdotally, we are aware that there have been an increase in the number of applications from the previous year, but at this stage, um, and until it closes, we won't have the information about the final numbers. Uh, and also, in terms of the reference to the 10x place call for evidence, we will be bringing a paper to RNC next week uh, just to update members on that and for agreement. Okay, excellent. Can I just get somebody to uh, second Barry's proposal, Josephine? Thank you. Just before you, you one caveat, Okay, please. yeah. No. Chair, just to say if Councillor McElduff was content, we have a provisional dates in the diary for July associated with the corporate plan, of which the economic development strategy is obviously going to be a core platform. So it may be we get it sequenced in first, if that's if that's okay. But we will certainly be reflecting economic development considerations as part of that and the wider relevant strategies, including 10x. But we, it's just in terms of sequencing of, of Councillor McAdoff's content. Are you happy enough with that, Barry? Josephine, yeah. Okay. And uh, are we all agreed then on Earl's proposal, seconded by Barry, that we issue the invitations uh, respectively? Yep, all agreed. Okay, excellent, thank you. And yes, we are going to take Alan in now, Seskinor Alan. Okay, and thank you, Chair. And um, um, my item is 23.1, Seskinor, the rural group. And um, it was resolved that uh, the council continues to liaise with Siskinor investigation of feasibility of community-led project. Uh, prior to the election, I think it was the 24th of May, we were to have a, a meeting, and obviously that was set aside until after the election. And uh, I believe that it would be prudent if it's not already on the pipeline for uh, a further meeting uh, to set to set the scene, really, I'm um, getting an indication from Alison maybe that that's in, in the pipeline, and uh, I would really appreciate that. And if, if it doesn't need a proposal, I'm happy to let it go. But if it needs a proposal, I'm happy to make it. Alison? Yeah. Um, Chair, no, Councillor Bainey is, is quite correct. We were waiting till the election was over, nominations confirmed, because we would wish to invite the West Rome councillors to such a meeting. And yes, we are looking at dates. We'll be liaising with the group. And as soon as we have that confirmed, uh, we will communicate that to members. Also mindful, there was the the, the 5K run and the fun walk and all associated yeah. activities. So the group have been well occupied as well during the intervening period. Yeah. So okay. we, we will we'll get that out as quickly as we can. Thank you, Chief Executive. Yeah. And Glenn? Okay, Harley, just to support the Thanks to Rene, and uh, of course, we'll be interested in, in that engagement as well. And and I suppose to put on record, uh, Chief Executive has mentioned the recent 5K. I would want to you know congratulate the Sesquinor Rural Community Group on the event. And uh, I I was there, and um, I suppose I arrived just in time, you would say. But I was not there for the very start. But it did give me the opportunity. Uh, not to reach the start line, but to see everybody leaving the start line. And it was very, very impressive. You know, um, families, uh, athletes, um, everyone together, you know, as, as we're used to seeing at these runs. But I have to say, I thought that the, the route itself was a scenic route that I've ever been on, you know. So it's, it's a beautiful part of the world and it's something that 
I know that we're all keen to support, but thank you, Chairman. I think you have a, a chosen career in tourism promotion there, Glenn, as well. Uh, Josephine? Chair, on an unrelated matter, I wonder if I could ask for some additional water to be brought to the Chamber, uh, just given the heat of the evening, and I think we're out of water. Thank you. Okay, we'll get that action. Thank you. Okay, and anything else on page 16? No, that concludes the minutes there. So we're going to move to item uh, six, and that's the matters arising from the special council meeting. I'm just going to bring Alison in on that item. Yes, Chair, as members will have seen, uh, we did have a special council meeting convened immediately before the election, which then uh, essentially was in court because the applications from Flint, sorry, Flint Ridge were withdrawn uh, on the day of the meeting. The previous mandate, Chair, it was actually the outgoing decision of the uh, mandate from 2015 to 2019 had resolved that all applications related to permitted development associated with mineral and associated companies would be determined by the full council. Um, so we have now had the applications resubmitted by Flintridge, and we also have two applications from Dalradian for variations of conditions, uh, which would also fall into this category. So we, we would just require a direction from the new mandate chair as to whether we would wish to continue for those matters to be resolved by the full council, or if you would wish to refer them to an alternate committee, for example, the planning committee. Um, in terms of the deadline, the decision point for these is the 21st of June. So in the event that the Council wished to continue to determine such applications, we would need to convene a special Council meeting probably on the 19th, uh, but we would also need to accommodate training for all members who have not previously uh, participated in planning training so that they could avail in the decision-making process. From an administrative perspective, Chair, either is, is certainly fully uh, feasible for us, but it's just to get the direction of the Council uh, as we head into this new mandate. Okay, thanks, Alison. Stephen? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I think that we saw over the course of the last mandate the great importance that was attached to these particular uh, issues, uh, particularly in communities such as uh, Greencastle and Ruski and Kavanagh, and indeed the importance that that there for put upon all of us having the opportunity to be able to scrutinise this with the greatest detail as possible. So on that basis, I would be uh, willing to propose that we stick with the model of putting this to uh, the, a meeting of the full council so that we can have the opportunity to fully debate and scrutinise these issues uh, in the appropriate manner. Thank you. John? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'd make the proposal with the short notice of this one and I had to put, put it back to the planning committee that the, the members on the planning committee are the ones with the expertise, so it's still sensible and logical. Conclusion, I think. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sean. Adam? Thank you, Chair. And whilst I do take Councillor Donnelly's point on this, I do have to agree with, with Councillor Feely. We have a planning committee for a reason, and it's a planning matter. So I'll second Councillor Feely's proposal. Okay, thank you. Victor? Yeah, it was just uh, basically we'll support the proposal from Councillor Feely. I think it makes more sense to refer it back to the planning committee because of the time limits that we have if we're going to have to meet in, uh, by the, the 19th of June. It's just going to put the councillors who haven't had the planning training under serious pressure. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Josephine? Well, Chair, I would like to second uh, Councillor Stephen Donnelly's proposal. Chair, I think that this is a matter of uh, brave importance to all of us, uh, and uh, the planning committee is limited to 13 members. And I would like to see a discussion uh, uh, that, that all members of this council have the opportunity to feed into uh, those discussions, the scrutiny uh, of the process and uh, uh, be part of uh, the decision making. So on that basis, I want to support Councillor Donnelly's proposal that we leave the arrangements as they are. Okay, thanks, Josephine. And our last speaker on this is Paul. Chair, no, I think we could, should be referred back to the Planning Committee. I agree with Councillor Feeney. Okay, thanks, Paul.
we have two proposals in, so I'm taking uh, the first proposal by Stephen and seconded by Josephine. Sorry, Mr. Jones, it's the first, it was the first second. Oh, was it? Oh, yes, it was first seconded, yeah. So John's proposal that, uh, and seconded by Adam, that it goes to uh, the planning committee. So uh, hopefully our technology is working uh, tonight. So if we can ask IT. Yep. So hopefully we are going to see a light coming on. And remember, yeah. Remember the plus is for negative against an X is staining. Okay, so press the one with the light and then vote. Yes, it's only on the chairs. No, but it does not okay. yeah. And when we're adding, can we have something that I can press here on the thing that shows me three minutes? You know, so that I can start oh. the clock and stop okay. the clock for three minutes? You don't. Well, possibly I'll yeah. check out, sir. Shouldn't be that major thing. Okay, so what does 91.6% mean? So that will be 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, Present, there's 36 people. 33 and 3 is 6, and then I have a half count vote. Uh, so 37. 33, 34 with your 34, 3. So, so it's correct. Okay. So that was a successful vote in our uh, electronic system. So uh, the vote is 34 for and 3 against. So that is passed. So we can go back to uh, planning with that. Um, can I have uh, just to accuracy? Is it? No, that's on the dominant. And that one yeah. doesn't need any accuracy as such out of this. We no. Check that earlier in the meeting. For the accuracy. Yeah. So you're on 87, right? Yeah. Or on Okay. Why that was the matters arising out of it, yeah. Okay. So we're on to item seven. So confirming the minutes of the special region and community uh, meeting, and this is for accuracy only, and that was on the 30th of March. So for accuracy, page one. Page two. Three. Four. Five. And six. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we need a proposal and seconder for those minutes. And um, Mark, uh, if you'd be so good as to propose. Happy to propose, Chair. Thank you. Thanks there. And seconded by Earl. Thank you. Seamus? Um, just Is it accuracy now, uh, Yeah, but it's just to clarify something. Um, maybe I'm completely, um, my memory is gone, but see the wee stars mm -hmm. beside uh, councillors' names there and that. Has them always been there, and what is the significance of them? Tending remotely? Mm -hmm. right. Sorry, just since we had the option for virtual remote meeting attendance, so anyone with an asterisk was there virtually at the meeting. Uh, so we wouldn't obviously tonight have any, you know, it's it's just for those. So that's why there's the mix. Uh, okay, we're moving on to item eight to confirm the minutes of the planning uh, committee held on the 19th of April, and that's for accuracy as well. So page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten, eleven, 
12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Proposer and seconder, please. I'll propose and a seconder. Uh, Bernard. No, 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 can't. Yeah. Um, Anthony? Yeah. He, you just need to be there. But good attempt there, Bernard. Good attempt. Um, okay, we're moving to point nine to consider a delegation of council powers to environmental services uh, committee in June to consider a, a report on draft response to DERA consultation on climate change uh, reported by specified public bodies. Uh, developing new regulations. Alison, is well, there anything you want to add? Just to say, Chair, the closing date for comments is the 30th of June, which will be before the Council meeting. So uh, just a proposer and seconder uh, for the tomorrow night's report, please. Seamus? Uh, yeah, I would propose that, yeah. Okay. And I'm sure that's not the seconding, so we'll go to Victor there to second. So uh, all agreed? Thank you. Okay, so we're moving to correspondence now. And our first is to note correspondence dated the 6th of April from the Housing Executive. Yes, Chair, this was really a follow up. The Council had previously made representations around Rosori Grove and concerns in particular about the funding model. So this is really the update uh, from the Housing Executive in terms to the how the service is being maintained, noting the wider budget pressures, and they have indicated a, a, a willingness to engage further with the Council on this subject, if that would be desired. Yeah. Diana? Chair, thank you. Yes, um, I welcome this, um, the, the fact that funding has been found, uh, albeit back with the original provider, um, Action for Children. I'm pleased to see that and, and do accept the pressures. Um, I think fundamentally the security of the young people in the home uh, needs to be reassured. And um, I think if we keep in touch and if we can be kept uh, informed as towards the end of this funding period, what the situation is, because certainly those those young people were very anxious. Um, welcome that and um, I propose we note the letter. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Dermot? Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me come in. Um, just noting the correspondence, and I think it's a great, great news that uh, Rosari Grove have been given that bit of security that they're going to get funding up until the end of, or up until April next year. Um, it's a fantastic resource, and it really is a lifeline for the young people that are in that residential area. Um, it's, it has caused great stress over the last um, period that the people in there could have ended up as homeless if that funding hadn't been secured. Um, on it's, you know, the funding is only up until April next year, so that stress will come back. It's not gone. Um, and I think it's just another um, example, if one was needed, why Stormont needs to come back and why we need to have a three-year, multi-year budget to secure that funding for the long term. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. Okay, and Diana, are you happy to note, uh, second and noting? Okay, going to move to uh, item uh, 10.2 to note correspondence date the 18th of April from the Department of Infrastructure regarding potholes. Yes, uh, Chair, I am mindful there's correspondence also tomorrow evening and also um, some additional information. But this particular letter had just come from the council meeting as members were, were not reassured in any of the uh, answers that have been received to date. So this is the response from the Divisional Roads Manager, really setting out the, the works that were undertaken, noting a significant body of work uh, remains and specific reference made to the drainage systems, which the Council have particularly queried uh, the maintenance approach in relation to those. Seamus? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, when you see all these figures down on paper and an email, it all seems uh, extraordinary, uh, you know, and seems like uh, work well done until you're actually out on the roads. Uh, all of these gullies and all of these um, uh, things that are cleared at the sides of roads, they have a, an auger now doing this. And um, uh, as far as I'd be concerned, it's actually causing more 
more problems than than it's solving. It's taking chunks out of the road. Uh, I actually had uh, somebody yesterday evening uh, rang me complaining who had been out walking along the road and had um, uh, was walking at the side of the road and uh, they fell into the channel because they put their foot in one of these um, uh, almost like a pothole that these augers were creating on the side of the road. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really not convinced about them them whatsoever. Uh, not only are they causing damage on the side of the road, but they're they're cutting through farmers' fa uh, fences and uh, 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 the ditches and um, uh, just letting the water run into their into their fields at random places. I think I think whoever come up with on machine and on idea, I think they they definitely need to go back to the drawing board on it. Uh, as for the potholes, uh, I have actually written there a month or so ago to the the department on their freedom of information to request uh, actually to the permanent secretary to request um, that they'd actually show us what money money saving that they're doing by uh, coming out and fixing potholes that are three or four inches deep. But then if there's one beside it uh, that they're not fixing it, but coming back a month or two months or three months later. And I would love to know how or in what sense that that's saving money. Because uh, if that was a, a, a private business was doing that, I cannot see that that would be the way you do it. Anyone that, that has any any idea of business, you know you, you, you go out one time, to, to sort something or to fix something is when you're out on site the first time. So I, I just, uh, I, uh, I don't know what to say about this letter. We've said it that many times previously. There's no head nor tail. There's, there doesn't seem to be any, any leadership in, in the department. And uh, I, I will wait uh, with bated breath for the for the result of this freedom from information request that I've sent to see what savings it ha they have on on this thing, and I would suggest that at some stage, uh, them augers are going to cause a a, a, a a large claim from either a cyclist or a. a uh, someone walking on the roads that uh, stagger into one of them things that the department's actually creating by taking chunks out of the tower. So, yeah, thanks, Seamus. And I totally agree. In actual fact, there's already, a, I know personally, there's already a claim in with the road service for, uh, I suppose, the auger works to a degree in the right conditions operated by the right person but uh, seemingly there is a lack of training or something going badly wrong as Seamus says they are dropping it on the road instead of dropping it in the grass uh, sometimes they're putting it through into fields other times they're putting it nowhere they're just driving it into the bank and uh, the water's going nowhere uh, you know they are uh, I know one time that they busted a man's water pipe with the auger and it was shooting 20 foot up into the air when I came across it uh, and the young fellow on the tractor just didn't know what to do he was sitting looking at it and you know uh, um, if you've seen it in a carry-on movie you wouldn't uh, be surprised you know but that is the standard of what we're getting out and worse than that when we actually get in contact with Brian Stewart who's the senior engineer here we're actually getting no traction whatsoever in I look into that. You know, this is the attitude that we're getting from uh, the department at this point in time. And certainly, correct me, Alison, if I'm wrong, that there was some correspondence that uh, could you maybe remind us of what the latest correspondence of uh, reporting back to the council? It will chair no, it was just in the context of the DFI briefings that Councillor McElduff had queried earlier. My understanding is the department will be moving to a much more generic form of correspondence as part of their cost saving measures. It hasn't started just yet, but it will be along the lines of your email or your letter or correspondence has been received and due to resource pressures, there will not be a personalised response provided. So I think um, that, that it hasn't, as I say, been started. affected. But I think that is uh, what we can expect quite soon. Okay, Anthony. 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'm not going to waste any time for yourself and Shame to cover it, but I was going to come in about that machine as well. And um, I mean, years ago when I, when I was um, a co well, co but after that, there was four or five councilmen who used to do a far better job with spades than they do now. So I have no belief in that machine at all, and maybe we as well go back to that. Yeah, well, I'm just happy to have proposed, proposed that. Okay, thank you. Alan? Okay, Chair, and I want to uh, support Councillor Green in relation to the gullies being emptied into the farmers' fields. Yeah. I suppose the water has to go someplace. That's very, you know, that, that, that's the norm. We, we don't have very much control over a cloudburst or whatever. But in the latter sentence here, where the department says where they want to take action against uh, the landowners if they detect water coming out of the gate, onto the road. So what's uh, is sauce for the goose could be sauce for the gander in this, in this uh, instance. And uh, I believe that it's grossly unfair just to uh, direct the water and where there's not uh, some form of channel to take it away or a pipe in, in, the, in the field. <coughs> the other situation that I find particularly on on the A class road uh, it's a two plus one section and there is a lot of surface water and if the gratings are not kept clear of debris they may not as well be there and getting uh, anything done about that it seems to work in a cycle as to when the, the, the gully clear vehicle is available for the area, and God knows, you seem to be able, you seem to uh, wait months before that would happen. And uh, it's a terrible situation altogether, where there's ponds of water on, on the A-class road, but just because of the, the sheer surface uh, that, that's uh, involved. And uh, it's, would it be the lack of manpower, is the lack of uh, uh, vehicles, uh, equipped to, to clear the manholes, I'm not too sure, but it certainly all needs to be really looked at in depth. Okay. Thanks, when Alan. we get an opportunity, I don't know, uh, uh, to question that, Chair, maybe your best yes, to arrange that. Yeah, I think uh, we have twice a year an opportunity there, so I think the next time if you keep that in mind as, as one of the issues that we want to bring up. So for the, for the New York Council's uh, councillors, twice a year we get road service to come in. Well, hopefully that's going to continue uh, and we get an up. I wouldn't bet on it, but um, we get an opportunity then to raise the issues there. And they bring us a nice glossy document telling us all the work they're going to do and what they have done and all the rest of it. So it's an opportunity. Okay, um, we're going to move to 10.3 to note the following items of correspondence from the Western Health and Social Care. Yes, Chair, the first item from the, the Trust, uh, it really related to a variety of, of discussions. So the first element of the letter deals with rheumatology, and this was regarding a realignment of rheumatolo uh, rheumatology services and the potential that um, clients, patients of the service had a change in that they had to go to OMA without any prior consultation or notification. There was then a wider discussion, Chair, regarding general service provision at Southwest Acute Hospital and particular concerns had been expressed regarding gynaecological and maternity services. So uh, each of those are responded to um, by the Chief Executive and noting in his uh, final uh, comments in the letter that where there is a, a major or controversial change to service, the Trust has clear guidance and this will be followed. Okay. So, I'm sorry then, sorry, Chair, the second letter was just regarding the early medical abortion service. We had been asked by the Council to clarify the Trust's operation of the service, the provision of it and the uh, effective dates. Okay, can I have somebody to note the correspondence, uh, Debbie and second is Stephen. Okay, moving on to 10.4, to note the following items of correspondence from the Department of Communities. I appreciate I alluded to these just slightly uh, earlier in, in the response to Councillor McElduff, but 
Just to advise members, this I suppose was the precursor letter that we received from the Department for Communities, which is then linked to the EQIA, and you will see the detail of, of the response. But in summary, what this letter is setting out is that because of the budgetary pressures on the department, uh, there will be a reduction in the rate support grant allocation. Um, for newer members, just to advise, rate support grant was a mechanism introduced by the department to support poorer councils, of which we were one. And we, uh, our allocation has changed very significantly. Um, if, if we go back, just say briefly, Chair, in 2015, which I appreciate is a while ago now, the council received just over 1.6 million. Um, but even if we go, and this, this year, our allocation is proposed to be 330,000 pounds. We were expecting to receive over 600,000, so we have an immediate cut of 200,000. But even if we go to 2021, we were getting just over 1.3 million. So this is a very serious, adverse financial impact to the Council itself. Um, the second area that this letter sets out is the removal or the pausing of funding for labour market partnerships. Um, these were, again, and are very significant measures around addressing economic inactivity. We have, as I say, Chair, responded to the um, the detail of the EQIA, so members will see that. But I think this is setting a, a worrying um, time ahead. And the second letter, Chair, also from the Department for Communities, is regarding the um, ending of targeting of the Affordable Warmth, Warmth Scheme, which again was very much a priority scheme within the Council and one of much need. Um, the, I, I just want to alert members to the fact that we are actually taking um, some separate advice on this regarding potential human resource implications, because I note there's a proposed transfer associated with the delivery of the function by the housing executive from the 1st of September. So we will be reporting that to you more fully through policy and resources. But to go back to Councillor McEldoff's earlier queries, I think if these letters are anything to go by, the next no number of months will be very challenging indeed. And do you want to cover the SOS? No, I think they did that separately. Separate. Separate. Okay. Can I have somebody to propose to note? Josephine and Paul. Okay. And we're moving on to 10.5 then to note correspondence date the 1st of June from Save Our Acute Services campaign. Thank you, Chair. Chair, this is a letter of uh, thanks on behalf of Saver Acute Services, both to those councillors who were not re-elected and also an uh, expression of congratulations and good wishes to those who have secured seats in the, in the new mandate. Okay. Could I have a proposal and second? Debbie, thank you. And Adam? Okay. Okay. Chair, there's one item of other proposals okay. that I have forwarded to members. Sorry. So I've just pulled it up here. Sorry, Chair, there is one item of other correspondence that I forwarded to members. I had I had thought I might have got it uploaded to decision time, but but wasn't able to do so. But this is um, a letter or an email that we've received this evening from the Western Health and Social Care Trust. And it advises that the trust uh, chief executive intends to establish what's being described as a strategic development group for the Southwest Acute Hospital. It will include senior leads and staff in the trust, senior department, sorry, Department of Health representation, uh, senior management and clinic and leaders in SWA, GP representation, key community stakeholders, providers in the area, independent health experts, and they're proposing to include a senior council representative, which be you chair and, and, and or a council executive member. It will be jointly chaired by the chief executive and a non-executive director of the trust board. Uh, and it's proposed that there will be a preliminary discussion regarding the establishment of this group on Thursday, the 8th of June, with a planned full meeting in SWA in August uh, 2023. And they will keep the Council updated on this in the weeks ahead. Um, so we have been asked, Chair, to confirm uh, whether you and or I would be available to attend this, the development group to give consideration to the discussion meeting. It says that at that meeting, Further consideration will be given to a draft proposed terms of reference, the purpose of the group, membership uh, and associated arrangements. So that, that really would be something for the Council to consider, Chair, if you would wish us to attend in, a, in an observer or any other capacity uh, and then to be able to report back clearly 
there's not very much information in the email other than what I have summarised to you. Okay, John. Thanks, Chair. Firstly, they don't give you much notice of these things, do they? That's the first first thing. But I don't. I wouldn't see any harm in if 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 the chair is free of going along just to see what they're talking about, kind of fact finding mission, and then report back. And, and uh, I suppose you're better off to be in the tent to begin with, anyhow, just to find out what it is. So my proposal is to give permission to the chair maybe to go. Okay. Thanks, John. Adam. Thank you, Chair, and I'm happy to, to second that. Uh, I do echo John's comments there about being in the tent. You know, we've been kind of crying out for more representation and decision making within the trust. And um, we might as well give it a go and see how it goes. Um, for what it's worth, Chair, there's two points that maybe might, if you or, or, or Alison, uh, when you're there, could bring up. Um, I think we as a council, as a, as a whole body, would really um love the chance to engage with such a group that that would be something that we'd like to do it could be a one-off special meeting uh, it could be an item in r c or it could be through our health and social care uh, subcommittee as well whichever would would be felt to be the most appropriate so i don't know if that's something that could be expressed if the rest of the chamber are, are content or think it's a reasonable idea and in terms of us being able to see what what's happening at uh, maybe either brief reports via email or again in meeting agendas, whichever is deemed most appropriate to see what's what's going on. Maybe in much the same way we get reports, uh, the trust board meeting minutes get sent out, just maybe that sort of matter, because it'd be really interesting just to keep tabs on that chair. Um, but that's all for now. Thank you. Yeah, Adam, cheers. Eddie? Uh, thanks for letting me come in on that. Um, I also would kind of echo what's been said so far. I welcome what uh, the news that this is going to be set up. Um, I recently attended um, a meeting with some MLAs from the other major parties with the Western Trust, and this was suggested that it was going to take place. So I'm, I'm happy to see that happen. Um, I'll hold my breath in terms of what that will achieve, but I'm glad to see that there's a definite attempt uh, here, and it was generally met uh, with, with uh, appreciation from the MLAs and myself at that meeting, that there is a genuine attempt here to to reach out to the Southwest Acute area um, and, and hopefully we will actually see some progress uh, and some development of cooperation between the Western Trust and the, the wider community here. Okay, so, okay, so uh, I take it we're all in agreement members that uh, we go along and we sort of find out as much as we can and report back and that will give us some understanding for the 30th of August then for whether we engage at that stage or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have two notice of motion. We have the first one is around education funding cuts, and uh, notwithstanding the the progress to some degree that that has made since this motion was first tabled, and it's Seamus that is going to propose, and myself to second the motion. So Seamus, you have three minutes. Sorry, five minutes. I was curtailing you. Thank you, Chair. I don't think I'll need that. Um, no, I'm. I presume everybody has read the motion, so I, I won't read it out again. Um, I, I was of a mind to uh, maybe amend the motion, but then, uh, subsequently, uh, some of the groups that thought they had got funding ended up not getting the funding. That was uh, that was promised, so I I went with the original motion. I really I really uh, uh, asked for everyone to support this motion because the attack on our young people by the the English Tory government uh, really is is disgusting. Uh, it's holding the people of the north to ransom. It's uh, and especially it's holding the young people and children of the north to ransom. And I think it's something that we all need to call out. It's outrageous. Some of these, uh, uh, some of these funding streams are are the lifeline of a lot of uh, young people in our in our district. Uh, the engage fund. Uh, imagine even the the holiday hunger fund. Like uh, I'll repeat that the holiday hunger fund has been cut completely. <laughs> you know that's the extent 
of of the Tory party that that decides to do the likes of that to hold us to hold uh, our young people and under uh, uh, under uh, nourished children to ransom to uh, try to force Stormont back up again and just on getting Stormont back up again I really do plead tonight for the DUP I'm sure the councillors over there uh, probably do not agree with Stormont being down this long and I, I would uh, ask them to go back to their leader and get the thing up and run again so that uh, our children and all the other services that's been cut uh, is actually something that's done with it that elected representatives are there to lobby the, the, the English Tory government to actually put proper funding into, into the, the, the community here. It's a disgrace that, that uh, a government that I think it's not 0.25% of the people of the North not 0.25% of the people of the North voted for the Tory government uh, in the, the last number of elections. And these are the people that for the last 12, 13 years has been cutting, cutting and cutting services to the places falling down around our ears. And now they've decided to uh, 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 attack our young people. It's it's disgraceful. So I commend this motion to the to the chamber. Okay, thanks, Seamus. And in seconding the motion, I'm uh, also calling for any of the cuts to funding to be reversed, and to the Secretary of State to intervene there and to uh, put back in place a funding that is vital for pupils in schools, vital for young people attending the two-year-old programs in play schools. We all know when the evidence is there to say that early intervention is critical. And seven years, a little plus to that, the two-year-old program was introduced in Newton Butler through the Pathways funding. And while a lot of uh, play schools got that uh, money reinstated, schools like Newton Butler didn't get that uh, funding reinstated because the pathway funding is a competitive uh, funded uh, program. And so they said, while uh, your uh, application uh, was uh, as usual, it didn't meet the demand that we had for funding. So uh, what I'm saying is that that fund in particular also needs to be made uh, a mainstream fund so that schools don't find themselves continuously in this where they're waiting right up until uh, June to find out if they have uh, places for children in the following year and or if they have to let staff go. So it's not a tolerable uh, situation for anybody to have to work in. And of course, the uh, Happy Healthy Minds Fund was cut uh, for the primary schools. And we are all very, very aware of mental health and good mental health for uh, young people and how important it is to uh, introduce that as at an early an age as possible and to be able to encourage young people to continuously uh, look after their mental health and uh, be able to talk about their mental health and be able to reach out there to somebody. So all of these programs, are, while they are relatively small money, make such a huge, huge difference, uh, not alone to the individual, children concerned but to the communities uh, we have less days off school we have uh, that translates into people being able to go to work more all of these knock-on effects uh, come with uh, the cuts to funding so uh, certainly in in I was delighted uh, to be able to second this motion and I commend it to the chamber okay so we have Eddie Thank you, Chair. Um, so the budgets that have been forced upon the departments across the board so far can only really be described as punishment budgets. Um, but the education department to this date has been particularly targeted. Um, the budget, di budget dictated uh, by this current Tory government may be with an aim to put pressure on the DUP to restore their assembly, but it would be the school children uh, of Northern Ireland that will suffer. The announcement yesterday in particular to drastically cut funding for special education needs was another cruel blow and head teachers across the country will now struggle to, the, to get their budgets to stretch 
uh, to even pr provide basic services in schools. The Education Permanent Secretary is currently being dictated to by uh, a Tory Secretary of State, and with no Education Secretary in place, they do not have the political cover that they should. Uh, we at the Alliance Party have called repeatedly for the restoration of the Executive, and as these budget cuts begin to bite now, the urgency required only increases. Okay, thanks, Eddie. Carbon. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, before I get on to the motion, as it's my first opportunity to do so, I want to congratulate you, yourself, and the Vice Chair um, on your appointments and wish you all the best for the year ahead. I've no doubt you still do a great job, and it's great to have a Mernese Councillor as Chair of Council. Um, you on, on to the motion. <laughs> Firstly, I want to thank Councillor Green and yourself for bringing this motion to Council this evening. Uh, the SDLP will, of course, be supporting it. I stand with my fellow Aranese councillors, as there are quite a few um, Aranese facilities named, um, but I stand with all the councillors in the fight again against these ridiculous cuts to the early years' education programmes and services. I do welcome, though, the very recent reverse and decision to retain some of the funding, but still fall short in my eyes as some of the facilities are still under threat. Um, these children who would be disadvantaged because of such cuts are our future and we must look after them, not hinder and deprive them. I know when I say this, as all of us councillors here, we're in full agreement of that. I have no doubt about that. Um, I have two young children at home and I would hate to be in a position where my kids were caught up in such cuts. I can't imagine the stress and worry other parents and ch of the children involved are going through. I, I would even have gone one step further with the guards of the motion and be seeking funding for help in childcare. Um, I know only too well the pressures of parents keeping down jobs and covering childcare costs. Um, parents here in the north are not even on the same playing field as parents from other parts of these islands. And this is something I feel a new executive when it gets back up and running, should be as one of the main priorities. Um, I also agree that the DUP's boycott of Stormont must end and end now, enough is enough, really. Um, if the executive was up and running, potentially these cuts and situations wouldn't even be heard of. So we will be supporting the motion. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Carvin. Josephine. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I think this is a very timely motion, Chair, uh, which I wholeheartedly support. Um, as a council, we have always been passionate about protecting our children and young people and ensuring that they have the best possible education and the best possible start in life. We heard earlier in the meeting of almost, almost half a billion uh, uh, funding gap uh, which uh, the Department of Education has to face just to stand still for the 23-24 year. And uh, this is an impossible task. This budget urgently needs to be reviewed. And only the Secretary of State, Mr. Heaton-Harris, has the power uh, to do that. And I think it's right that we should call upon him uh, to do that. Um, these education uh, funding cuts have caused great anxiety uh, to parents, to teachers, and indeed to the whole community, uh, because the education of our children must be afforded the highest priority. I do also support uh, uh, the call uh, by this council for the Democratic Unionist Party to return to the assembly. I think that the needs of our community are very great at the moment, and uh, I think that if the DUP can work uh, to um, get the assembly uh, institutions restored, then I think that would be uh, greatly to their credit. And all other outstanding concerns regarding uh, um, uh, the Windsor Agreement, uh, I would be optimistic, can be sorted out in due course. So that said, uh, Chair, I'm happy to uh, support this motion and thank Councillor Green and Councillor O'Reilly for bringing it forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chair Thank you. Yes, thanks, thanks, Chair. And I just want to thank my colleague here, Seamus, for bringing this motion and yourself for seconding it. And I was just coming in on the same same vein as, as Councillor Reef there about the announcement yesterday about the half of the budget for the SENs. I think that's desperate altogether. The most vulnerable in our society is going to get affected here 
the, the kids that need the help at schools. And I was just chatting with one of the principals this morning about this and about the problems going to face next year now. And there's going to be a big reduction in cutting staff, going to affect staff, classroom assistance. And as Josephine says, it's just affecting the whole community. And I just think it's desperate the way we're being treated over here. And, and I just reiterate what everybody else has said here. And if the DUP there has any influence on, on the, them to try get back in the power, and get this thing to sort out as, as, as quick as we can. It can't go on much longer. And just thank my colleagues for bringing this up. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Mark? Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, we, we oppose this motion before us uh, this evening. It's not because we aren't concerned about any potential cuts to key services, but it's because we believe this motion is more a party of political attack on the DUP than it actually is about fund cuts. The motion effectively claims that the cuts or the proposed cuts are all the DUP's fault. By the same token, then, are the proposers happy to accept um, that, the D that the DUP takes some credit for the very cuts that they've listed not happening? Similarly, do the proposers accept that funding for programmes such as extended schools over these past five years has only been present because of the finances secured through the confidence and supply agreement? The truth is that the real focus of this motion isn't about vital services, but about an attack on the DUP. The fault lies with the Secretary of State for handing down an uh, inadequate budget and more widely on the lack of a needs-based funding formula for Northern Ireland. We are currently being failed by the Barnett formula, which doesn't meet the assessed needs here. We were very clear when proposed cuts to Sure Start and Pathway Fund and others were announced that this was a choice by the Secretary of State. Some other parties attempted to let him off the hook and claim that if Stormont returned in the morning, that magically everything would be okay. The truth was made clear last week. The cuts to those programmes are not taking place, and that decision was made in the absence of an executive, just as we said it could be. The Permanent Secretary was also very clear that cutting areas like Sure Start would actually worsen the budgetary crisis in future years, and it would store up greater pressures in later years for areas like special educational needs. What is also true is that a restored executive and assembly won't make budget pressures disappear. There aren't hundreds of millions of pounds sitting around in some magical storm bank account, like some parties were claiming. We want to see the Assembly restored and the Executive up and running as soon as possible. But the idea that it will make these problems disappear is ridiculous. The claim that somehow there will be an influx of funding to education as soon as storm returns is also deliberately misleading parents, teachers and pupils who are suffering the most from the chronic underfunding within the Department of Education. There's a 500 million funding shortfall within education alone for the next year. You know, if a local minister comes into the office uh, in the morning, they aren't going to find that sort of money down the back of a storm on sofa. The amount we need to spend on special educational needs has doubled in the past eight years. It now accounts for nearly a quarter of the entire budget for education. What is needed is a fundamental reform in our funding structure something which the DUP has been highlighting. Dealing with this year's problems doesn't solve the fundamental issue, which will turn into a bigger problem next year. What we're focused on is trying to secure a long-term solution rather than short-term firefighting. It would be much more productive if all parties in the Chamber could support the Council writing to the Secretary of State to call for a fundamental review of how public services are funded and to call for a needs-based model to be introduced here. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thanks, Mark. Patrick. Mark to Carly. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I want to speak in support of the motion. Um, I know we've already said about last week's announcement that there was some progress from these cuts, um, but even without that, there was cuts already earlier this year to the early year sector um, and youth services. I know my own DEA groups such as Camo and Smart Kids, the Patent Fund on Lake's Bright Start, and that's a lifeline to many and crucial to supporting children's development. These cuts that were initially proposed and now have been stopped would have impacted the local economy as well by staff losing their jobs and the reduction of services, meaning parents wouldn't have been able to go to work. Most of all, however, obviously it would have impacted on children's well-being, learning and development. And all of that is a result of Tory austerity. So it's important that we as a council reiterate our opposition to the budget being imposed on us by the Secretary of State from a party that received a total of less than 500 votes in the most recent election here. I think that highlights the current constitutional arrangements have an impact on people's daily lives and the urgency that there is in us planning for Irish Unity, so those elected in London no longer have control over our public services and our, and, uh, our finances. In the interim, I would also appeal to the DUP to get back to the executive and do what we can with the power that exists in Stormont 
to priority some of the most vulnerable in our community. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Patrick. Diana. Just coming in at the conclusion of this debate, a lot of what I was going to say obviously has been said. Um, I, I do speak in support of the motion. Um, I think it is welcome. I think, as Councillor Dehan said, young children are the most vulnerable uh, and in society and need the best support, the best start in life. Um, I do welcome that the Permanent Secretary did um, give a reprieve for the, the Sure Start funding, the Bright Start and, and Toy Box. And I know myself as a councillor in Irvingstown when I see the benefits of Sure Start and the impact it has in Irvingstown, that like many other local councillors, we need to retain those services. Um, just in conclusion, the Ulster Unionist Party will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Janet. Adam? Thank you, Chair. And, and I would like to focus my comments towards uh, the final point of the motion, which is calling for uh, a much and long overdue return to the Assembly. Because at the end of the day, local ministers making local decisions is best for everyone. And I'd like to, 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 quote, to start my comments with a quote. It is wrong in a democracy that one party is able to veto the establishment of a government. It is wrong to blackmail the entire community and say you cannot have government until we get our way. That is not the way that democracy should function. We need Stormont back up and running. And who am I quoting? None other than Geoffrey Donaldson a number of years ago when Sinn Féin were out of government. It achieved nothing then, and it will achieve nothing now. And this boycott will achieve nothing and cause nothing but hurt to the most vulnerable in our society and achieve dreadful outcomes and results for everyone. I am hoping that the DUP councillors here tell their leader to get back to work. Maybe he'll listen, but I doubt it, because the absolute dissonance between his previous words, which I have quoted, and his current actions would make any reasonable individual believe that he is a hypocrite in his approach to government and how this place should operate. Abstaining responsibility isn't an option. People are struggling. And although there was some reprieves to the cuts in this motion, there are many more difficult and horrible outcomes coming down the line. And we need a government to fight for people here because we all know the Tories don't give a damn and they'll do what they want to do to cause damage here. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Adam. Other again? Um, thank you, Chair, and good luck for the year ahead, Thomas and Amory. Um, I speak on, as a teacher um, who feels very, very passionate about this. I see the impact that the Engage funding cut um, had on the school I teach in and the impact it had on the pupils. Um, the holiday hunger funding, it's just unbelievable and um, the impact that that's going to have and our children deserve better and um, they really really do i see how important those things that were there are to those children and the confidence that they gain and especially the engaged funding we did it in a pastoral way and um, it gave a lot of uh, anxiety chilling for pupils um, and i too would like to call on the dup um, to get back to work, to get, I was going to say a phrase and I'll not bother actually, um, but to really reconsider what is going on because our children really, really, really do deserve better. They are the future. What future is there going to be if we keep getting cuts? Okay, yeah, thanks, Martin. Okay, that's the last of our speakers. So I'm going to go to Seamus now. You have two minutes to uh, sum up, Seamus. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I'd like to thank all of the councillors who have spoken in favour of the motion. Uh, needless to say, I want to answer the DUP's uh, assertion that that um, this was politically motivated and that this motion was an attack on them. If they think that, that the way that that's awarded was an attack on them, uh, they don't know me too well because uh, I would have certainly went a lot, lot stronger on a, if it had been a, a direct attack on them. Uh, but once Councillor uh, Buchanan talked about the, mon the money they got on the confidence and supply uh, agreement, uh, 
maybe he should remember that the confidence and supply agreement, yeah, they got a, a, a few pound on, on it, but they supported a Tory government for four years, kept them in power in the midst of uh, the harshest austerity budgets, one after another. They have voted for them. They have voted against pay rises for the nurses. They have voted uh, on every cut that there was going. So whatever few pounds they got back, they had already voted uh, 10 times over cuts on that, on that budgets. So uh, if I had wanted to attack the DUP, I would have put all that in the motion, but I did not. Uh, but. Um, so, uh, 15 so, seconds, Seamus. Okay, so I, I, I leave it at that and I, I'll uh, again commend the motion to the, the Chamber. Okay, thank you. Have we agreement on the motion? No. Okay, uh, could we set up a vote then? Okay, I think we're ready to go. Get to vote. Okay. Do you get to vote? You've won on this system. Yeah. Yeah, just a clip lock, mm -hmm. but this isn't as for anyone. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so then that's starting in all six is thirty two to six. Yeah, yeah thirty two six. Thirty two six. You happy enough? Okay, so the vote is in thirty two in favour, six against, so that uh, motion is passed. Okay. Thank you, members, on that. We're going to move to our second motion, and uh, that's uh, proposed uh, by uh, Councillor Stephen McCann and seconded by Glenn Campbell. So, going to invite uh, Stephen to propose the motion, and you have five minutes, Stephen. Okay, thank you, Chair, and uh, congratulations to yourself, Thomas, and Anne Marie, and best wishes for your, for your year ahead in office. Chair, I'll take the motion as being, as being read, okay? So, since this Council last met, there have been several developments in the Kelly family's journey for truth and justice for their beloved Patsy. For those here tonight who may be unfamiliar with the case, Patsy Kelly lived in the townland of Golan in Trillick. He was a much-loved husband of Teresa and devoted father to his children, Geraldine, Barry, Fergal, Una, and Patsy Jr. Patsy was also an elected representative, just like us all here. He was elected to the legacy Oma District Council by the people of the Trillick area, and he was a widely respected and hard-working councillor. And indeed, Patsy's portrait looks down from the wall from the members' room of the council offices at the Grange in Oma. In the early hours of the 24th of July, 1974, Patsy Kelly was abducted and murdered as he made his way home from the bar that he ran in Trillick. It is widely believed that members of the Ulster Defence Regiment were responsible for his murder. Patsy's remains were not discovered until the 10th of August 1974. Two fishermen located Patsy floating in Loch Eyes near Lisbelaw. His remains had been weighed down by a 56 pound weight attached to his body by a green nylon rope. A post-mortem examination established that Patsy had been shot six times with a .455 caliber revolver. Since Patsy's murder almost 50 years ago, his family have campaigned with the utmost resilience and dignity to find out what exactly happened to him. They have been let down many times over the decades, false promises, obstructions and denials, time and time again, but still they persevered on with dignity. In January 2018, the Kelly family made a statement of complaint to the police ombudsman's office about the actions of police after Patsy Kelly's murder. On the 26th of April this year, the police ombudsman, Marie Anderson, published her report into the investigation into the police conduct around the circumstances of Patsy's murder and what dismal reading it makes. The Ombudsman identified a number of significant failings, including the failure to adequately verify UDR alibi witness accounts, failure to make inquiries about footwear marks, and that relates to two footprints found on the Bodoni Road, 
where Patsy was abducted from, and these, these imprints were similar to boots issued to the security forces at that time. Failure to recover a boat at Lock A's, and that's in relation to a piece of material found attached to the boat that was found to have originated from Patsy's shirt that he was wearing on the night he was abducted. There was no record of any fingerprint inquiries, and this is in relation to six fingerprints recovered from Patsy's burnt out car. There was no follow up to this at all. There was failures, failures identified in making inquiries about an anonymous letter sent to the commanding officer of a military establishment in Oma. This letter named four UDR members as being involved in Patsy's murder. Failure by special branch and senior RUC officers to disseminate intelligence. Failure by the senior RUC officers to act on intelligence. And the Ombudsman uh, discovered investigative bias. The report also refers to collusive behaviour, and that's in reference in the actions of RUC special branch and a police officer who was referred to in the report as police officer two. The findings make very hard reading and completely vindicate the Kelly family's 50-year campaign, who have always alleged that the circumstances around the killing were covered up. The family have been totally failed by a wholly inadequate police investigation. In light of the police ombudsman's damning report into the police investigation into Patsy's murder, the Kelly family immediately petitioned the Attorney General for a fresh inquest into Patsy's murder, and subsequently this was refused a decision which added additional hurt to the Kelly family. The Kelly family has sought a, a judicial review into this awful decision by the Attorney General. Bearing in mind that the original inquest in 1975 recorded an open verdict, and bearing in mind that the you police... 15 seconds, uh, Stephen. ...only has remit to investigate police failings, a new inquest is now required. Only a new inquest would allow the spotlight to focus on UDR involvement in the Patsy's murder and would possess the power to compel witnesses to attend and submit testimonies. Only a fresh inquest can uncover the truth as to what happened to Patsy on that night. And just finally, Chair, uh, if you'll allow me, in bringing this motion tonight, I am conscious that many families in this area from all backgrounds have, great, have greatly suffered throughout the last number of decades. And I fully support their right also to have access to truth and justice as well. But as a councillor re-elected from the Trillic area, and in light of these recent developments, I feel it's appropriate that tonight we bring this, uh, this motion forward. And I want to publicly commend Theresa and her family for her courage, dignity, and sheer determination to date. They have faced obstacle after obstacle and continue to face obstacles on the journey for truth and justice. And I think that is absolutely the right thing for this local government authority to do and putting on record our support for the Kelly family for the time ahead. Thank you for your patience there, Chair. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Glenn? Voice uh, to, of support to the Kelly family uh, and their call for a fresh inquest into the murder of Patsy Kelly. Uh, the Kelly family has been relentless in their pursuit of truth and justice uh, for almost 50 years almost 50 years since 1974, and their courage, dignity, and dedication to their campaign uh, throughout that time is inspirational to us all. Councillor McCann has referenced the recent Ombudsman's report, which has been thoroughly damning of the role of the RUC, clearly stating that the family were failed on so many levels uh, by the RUC. They were most definitely uh, and, and most grossly failed by the RUC in the British state, However, it's clear that the term failure comes nowhere close to describing uh, the role uh, played by the RUC and, and other actors of the British state in the murder of Patsy Kelly. Those who colluded in his murder, the subsequent cover-up and the destruction of evidence. They failed the Kelly family, but they succeeded in doing what the British state and their collaborator, collaborators have done in Ireland for, for generations. It is nothing short of disgraceful that in the immediate aftermath of this damning Ombudsman's report, the Attorney General has refused a fresh inquest into the murder of Patsy Kelly. An inquest, as Councillor McCann has said, that is vital if the family are to get the answers to the questions they have been asking for almost 50 years. And, and, and Stephen has rightly said that nothing short of a full inquest will do, uh, and Sinn Féin fully supports the Kelly family and their campaign. Patsy Kelly was of course, a former councillor of the legacy Oma District Council has been stated, and I feel it's important that this council again puts on record our support for the Kelly family and assure them that we stand with them at this time. And in conclusion, Chair, in conclusion, Chair sorry, 
uh, I, I would urge uh, those from across the chamber uh, to be united and to support uh, the call for a fresh inquest and to support the motion tonight. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Patrick? Um, I too would like to commend my party colleagues, Stephen McCann and Glenn Campbell, who brought this motion forward to us. Um, I too support the family, in the, the Cali family, in their call for a fresh inquest into the murder, especially in the light of the new information and reiterate my continued support on their journey for truth and justice. I admire their resilience, their courage, and their bravery. I too admire the bravery of Kathleen O'Hagan's family. Kathleen, like Patsy, was murdered. She was murdered in 1994, and she was a family friend of my own, particularly to my mummy, God rest her, and I will never forget Kathleen for that. Her children were nearby. She was pregnant. Kathleen's family, the McInnesby family, and the Kelly family deserve justice, just like every family who have lost loved ones. Therefore, I support the motion and again commend Stevie and Glenn for bringing this forward. Okay, thanks, Paul. Again, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to start by thanking Councillor McCann and Councillor Campbell for bringing forward this motion, particularly as I know that uh, Councillor McCann has a close connection to the Kelly family and to this particular case. The murder of Patsy Kelly was a brutal and awful taking of innocent life. And decades on, the devastation wrought by his killing reverberates still through his family, Trillick, and the wider community. Our thoughts are with the Kelly family following the events of the last number of weeks, which inevitably have, will have made for an incredibly painful listening, which follow on from decades of false dawns and disappointments. The findings from the recent police ombudsman report found that not only were there significant investigative failings, but that there was evidence of collusive behaviours. These are deeply serious findings and should trouble all of us who believe in a society that is underpinned by respect for the rule of law and for the right to life. The family of Patsy Kelly, unfortunately, will never have the person they love back, but they deserve every ounce of support that can be offered to enable their pursuit of truth and justice. That door should be shut to no grieving family. Chair, on behalf of Alliance, we will be supporting the motion. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Er? Thank you very much, Chair. Well, at the outset, can I just say that I remember the incident very well. I was 12 years of age. And at that time, there were numerous murders that took place around the Fermanagh Nome area. I'll just leave it at that, at that stage. The murder of Patsy Kelly was wrong, and we have no problem in saying that clearly. It would be useful to hear the proposers of the motion, however, and their party, be clear about all murders in Northern Ireland. And I know Councillor McKeon has referred to it in passing. Can we imagine the response if someone were to step forward? and make the outrageous claim that there was no alternative than to murder Patsy Kelly. Unfortunately, that is the stance taken by the Sinn Féin leader in relation to countless other, other murders. In relation to this specific case, it has been the subject of several investigations, something not enjoyed by many other families who have suffered the murder of a loved one. We must also be careful about judging events which occurred up to 50 years ago, against the contemporary standards and ignoring the substantial operational challenge, challenges that face policing over many decades here, including the life and death reality that extremely difficult decisions were being made on a daily or even early basis in the face of a threat to the lives of police officers and the wider public. Regrettably, that meant mistakes will have been made. But that is not comparable with an allegation of colluding with terrorists. The police ombudsman has used the term collusive behaviour, which is a vague term that is without any definition in law. It is worth noting that not a single prosecution or a misconduct file has been brought forward on the basis of that terminology. This has been highlighted by the Northern Ireland Retired Police Officers Association. We also note the comments of the Police Federation in relation to the Police Ombudsman's comments, and I quote, Suffice to say that in the past, this Federation has been singularly unimpressed by the narrative provided and conclusions reached following historical investigations conducted by the Office of the Police Ombudsman for Northern Ireland. Of particular concern are the findings of alleged, alleged collusive behaviours, 
made in the absence of providing any evidence that would ordinarily have to be vigorously tested and determined by either misconduct or criminal process processes. Unquote. The family of Patsy Kelly deserved justice for their murder for the murder of their loved one. So too do thousands of other families, many who haven't had the most basic of investigation carried out into the murder of their relative. We are very concerned about the United Kingdom government's plans to effectively grant an amnesty to those responsible for every murder in Northern Ireland. No family should be denied access to justice. There should be, no, there should be equality of access for everyone. For the reasons outlined, Chairman, the uh, Democratic Unionist Party are against the motion. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, sir. Adam? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and it's incredibly evident that our society has experienced trauma over previous decades. And there are a lot of scars and still open wounds to many in terms of what they have faced and experienced and what their families have been put through. And in regards to this motion, uh, our thoughts as a chamber should, should lie with the Kelly family. No doubt the refusal to grant a fresh inquest will have caused significant and serious hurt and distress to them. They've been through this for decades, nearly 50 years, as many have said before. And it's simply unacceptable that anyone in this society should not get answers and should not get access to truth and justice. Councillor McCann very well, uh, excellently laid out the findings of that police ombudsman report. And the investigation was found, and I quote, uh, and Councillor McCann said this to be wholly inadequate. And this is totally unjust. No family, no matter what has happened, no matter who they were, no matter who committed an atrocity or a murder, should have to basically go through this where they are refused any sort of justice. And the ASDLP have always been at the forefront of calls for truth and justice for absolutely everyone. And in this case, we are 100% supporting the Kelly family at this time. Thank you, Chair. Adam. Patrick. Thank you, Chair. I just want to thank uh, Councillor McCann and Councillor Campbell for bringing the motion. Um, first of all, I want to express my solidarity and support to Patsy's widow, Teresa, and the rest of the Kelly family, who have never given up on finding the truth of what happened to Patsy and getting justice for him, despite repeated blockages by the British state and attempts to cover up what happened to him in July 1974. The suggestion that the Kelly family obtained all the relevant answers from the police ombudsman's report by the Attorney General is wrong and misconceived. The police ombudsman's report, by definition, is confined to the examination of issues related to the RUC and the PSNA. It is clear that as well as the police, other components of the state, including the Ministry of Defence, have important issues to address and questions to answer. These can only be properly and fully addressed in a fresh inquest. And given what we now know, as regards to wide-scale collusion across multiple agencies of the British state, it is simply appalling that a fresh inquest has been denied. This case is also a further reminder, if ever it was needed, that the British government's legacy bill, which would close down the right to truth and justice for families, like that of Patsy Kelly, needs scrapped, and the legacy mechanisms that were agreed in the Storm House Agreement in 2014 should be implemented without delay. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Patrick. Thank you, Chair. Well, the Ulster Unionist Party condemns the killing of Patsy Kelly, and indeed we condemn the killings of all innocent people by both Loyalists and Republicans. And we recognise the rights of the families of victims of the trouble to obtain justice for their loved ones. This Sinn Féin motion, while echoing these sentiments, has to be balanced against their overall party strategy. When their party leader in Northern Ireland and Force Minister Desi, Michelle O'Neill, stated that there was no alternative to the armed struggle, 
she must recognise that this led to a cycle of violence. Sinn Féin have shown they have an undeniable link to the, link to the provisional IRA and so hold the key link to justice for families. They cannot continue to call out one side and remain silent on the others. This party will not support a hierarchy of victims. All victims deserve answers and deserve justice, and there will never be a justification of the murder of maiming of anyone, regardless of colour, or creed, religion, or anything else. Our party will not be supporting the motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Victor. Josephine? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Well, I want to speak in support of the motion and thank Councillors McCann and Campbell for bringing forward this motion, which again is very timely. <clears throat> Chair, in April of this year, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, which uh, effectively saw the end of three decades of violence, which, as many members have alluded to, caused uh, the, the death of very many people and the devastation of many families and that is something to be regretted and those deaths uh, uh, have brought great suffering uh, to, to families. Uh, Chair, I am a child of the Troubles. In 1974 I was doing my A-levels waiting to go to university. Um, uh, like Councillor Thompson, I <clears throat> remember the murder of Patsy Kelly very well. Patsy Kelly was a second cousin of my late mother who was also a Kelly, whose family hailed from Golan in Trillick, and his sister May was a neighbour of ours in Dromoor. And I remember that terrible summer and the weeks before his remains were discovered. It was a murder that was unparalleled in its callousness, its brutality, and its lack of mercy. And I agree with those members who say that the Kelly family have conducted themselves with great dignity. And when I see the images of Mrs. Teresa Kelly, the anguish on her face, uh, reading these reports into the murder of her beloved husband, it certainly is heartrending. Members have said every family deserves truth and justice, and so too do the Kelly family deserve truth and justice. The original inquest returned an open verdict in 1975, there was not enough information at that time. The investigations have been shown to be incomplete. And uh, I too was shocked that the Attorney General had declined a fresh inquest. I believe that is necessary. I believe it will be necessary for the Kelly family to achieve truth and to come to ter some terms uh, with the loss of a dear husband and father. Uh, and I too extend my sincere condolences to Teresa and the Kelly family and I want to support the motion chair. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. And that concludes our speaker. So I'm going to go to Stephen. Uh, you have two minutes to sum up, Stephen. Okay, thank you, Chair. And I want to thank everyone who has who has spoke in support of the motion this evening. I know to have the support of the council and your support will mean a great lot to the Kelly family. A fresh inquest into Patsy's killing should now be granted chair without any further delay. The family have been waiting to hear the truth now for far too long. On the back of tonight's motion, Chair, I would hope that you might write to the Kelly family just to let them know that this motion has been tabled tonight and to formally send our support to them. On that note, I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. And as there's uh, uh, dissent in the chamber, can we set up a vote? Okay, votes open. Mm -hmm. So twenty six, I don't twenty six. Twenty six. Eleven is twenty six. Eleven, yeah. yeah. And yours is 27. Eh? 27. 27 okay, uh, that motion is passed 27 to 11. Okay, that concludes the motions. And I'm moving to point 12, 
which is any urgent and relevant business. And the first person I'm going to invite to deal with his business is Paul. Thank you, Chair. I just want to bring up with the library in Final Town. There's nothing that's happened to the library in Final Town. The last time we wrote, we got a letter back saying that they were going to start. Building work would start April and May. There's not a thing that's happened since. So I would ask, could we write now a letter to the library board to see when, when they're going to start or what is the, what's happening at the minute? The other issue is I was contacted about antisocial behaviour at the Ardoan Theatre out on the jetties at the weekend and during the week and has been ongoing this last couple of weeks with the good weather and that there. The police is involved in it and it's only a matter of time that somebody's else drowned or badly injured in the, at these jetties. It's happened before. We've lost lives in Loch Erin before. We don't want this to happen again. Uh, is there any way we can secure our own property? They're crossing the council ground to go down to these jetties. Is there any way this can be secured so they can't get down to these jetties anywhere? And that, so that's all I have to raise. Yeah, we'll investigate, uh, Paul, and come back. And certainly we can certainly like. Yeah. Keith, are you seconding yep. the. Uh... Uh, thank you, Chair. And likewise, on the, the Ardoan Theatre. I know it is an issue with the jetties all out at, at the Killy Heaven, and obviously the good weather we're having is making it 10 times worse. But uh, I know with tourists and that coming in with the, with boats and things like that there, and uh, the antisocial behaviour going on at night, it's, it's upsetting them as well. Mm -hmm. Just put that out there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are we all agreed, members? Okay, and our second uh, person is Stephen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in OMA, we have a strong network of small businesses that every day demonstrate serious creativity and energy, and it's always a pleasure whenever this is recognised on a bigger stage. And I was delighted at the weekend to see at the Northern Ireland Hair and Beauty Awards that Hugga, one of our local businesses in the Foundry Lane area of the town, won the award for Hair Salon of the Year in uh, all of Northern Ireland. This is a massive achievement for Chloe Ewing and her team, who through hard work and determination have brought a real sense of energy to the Foundry Lane area. And it's particularly remarkable when it is considered that the seeds of this success were not planted in stable times, but rather Chloe Ewing launched Hugga at the height of COVID-19 in times when it wasn't even possible to open her premises. As a council, I believe it is right that we recognise and celebrate a good news story when we get one. And Chloe Ewing and her team have undoubtedly provided OMA with yet another reason to be proud. And so I'd request, Chair, that you write to Hugga to express the congratulations of this chamber, as well as our gratitude for the enduring positive contribution that they make to our economic and civic life. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Josephine? Yes, uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks to Councillor Donnelly for bringing this to Council tonight. And I mean, I uh, share uh, his sense of celebration of a magnificent achievement by Chloe and her team at Higa. I think it's remarkable uh, and it brings uh, with it a very unusual for these times sense of optimism uh, regarding how businesses can thrive in what are really very challenging uh, circumstances. So I want to second Councillor Donnelly's proposal uh, on this occasion, Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Josephine. You have seconded. So, any just for future reference, so that everybody's aware, if there is any other business, then that has to be uh, relayed to me before the meeting. And when you're then, if you're looking like the two uh, people here tonight for a seconder, then that's okay for a seconder to come in. But the floor is then not open to anybody else, Earl. And uh, unless you have notified me, the floor is still not open. So uh, we, I think we can uh, safely say it's not open. Uh, so um, those two have been proposed and seconded uh, actions. So are we all agreed, members? Yep. Okay. Can I now have a proposal and seconder, Stephen and Paul, to go into committee? So we'll just uh, allow it a wee second to do that.
Okay, then I'll ask Alison to give us a little resume of what took place. Okay, Chair, thank you. While in committee, the Council confirmed and signed the confidential minutes of the Council meeting held on the 4th of April. There were no matters arising from those minutes. And the Council also confirmed the confidential minutes of the Special Regeneration and Community Committee meeting held on the 30th of March and the Planning Committee meeting held on the 19th of April. Yeah, can I have a pose it, Diana and Adam? Okay, that's us. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to all the staff and to all of you. Uh, a lot of business concluded in a timely manner. Safe home. It's almost well done.